Get a little too close to home right there. Mm, man, I even picked what colors I wore today to match the team I'm rooting for tonight. But we welcome Patriots fans too. It's all good. Patriots fans are welcome to be here too. Eagles fans, Kentucky fans. Yeah, um, man, that, that hit close to home for sure. And as you can probably imagine, based on seeing the graphic, watching the video, you kind of see where we're heading here. Uh, today we're launching a new sermon series called Don't Have a Cow. Anybody ever heard that sentence before, Don't Have a Cow? The, the reason I'm asking is because uh, I picked that title, and we debated it a long time before we decided to really stick with that, because I was thinking, maybe nobody's ever heard that before. I'm, living, I'm at the age now where people I'm learning don't know what Gilligan's Island is, uh, Andy Griffith, and I'm like, oh no, I don't know. Do people even know what that means? Do people say that anymore? Don't have a cow, man. Don't have a cow. So uh, hopefully that means you understand what that is. Uh, but we're l talking about having a literal cow because what we're going to look at together today is a historical account of the people of God who had a cow. And we're going to see exactly what they did there, and they actually created this cow to kind of replace God. And that's where we're tracking together for this whole sermon series is this is something that uh, maybe all too well we can relate to. Now, you're probably thinking, I don't know if I can relate to having a cow or not, uh, but we're going to look at this together in Exodus 32. If you have your copy of the Bible, feel free to turn there. We'll look at the first six verses together here in just a moment. But to sort of lay down the background of what's happening, um, in, in the history of Israel, God's people, uh, they were chosen by God, and he, he, he made a people for himself through Abraham and his descendants. They ultimately were in the nation of Egypt in slavery. And what God did is he raised up a leader, Moses, to go to Egypt and deliver his people from slavery, take them out of that land, which successfully God did. And, and really, when you go back and read that story, it was just miracle after miracle after miracle of what God did. Probably my favorite part of it is after he had led them out of slavery, that they were basically pinned in between the Red Sea and the Egyptian army because Pharaoh changed his mind, decided he did want to go keep the Israelites in slavery. So they were kind of stuck. But God told Moses to raise his staff and the Red Sea parted and uh, the Israelites walked across the Red Sea on dry ground. But when the Egyptian army followed them, the waters came down and defeated the enemies of Israel. Pretty epic stuff, right? But if you read the account of the Israelites and, and them continuing to follow the leadership of Moses and to go towards the promised land, man, it was a rocky roller coaster. And sometimes I read it and I'm like, oh, these Israelites, what's wrong with them? But the problem is some of the things we see them doing, thinking, and behaving are actually subtly ways we behave as well. There are tendencies that they had that we tend to exhibit as well. So to give you a little background, here's what's been going on. Moses had gone up on Mount Sinai, and God was literally giving him this thing we call the law, the covenant law, because he'd made Israelites his people, so now he wanted them to understand, okay, so if I'm going to be your God and you're going to be my people, we need to come to an agreement with each other. You need to understand what it means to worship me, what it means to live the way I would have you live. So to help them understand that, he was literally writing the law, giving it to Moses, and Moses was going to take it to the people. So the last verse in chapter 31 says this. When the Lord finished speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the two tablets of the covenant law, the tablets of stone, inscribed by the finger of God. Big deal. He had the stone tablets. God had written on it the law, and he was going to be taking it down to the people for them to know and understand who God is and how to live for him. But then in verse 1 of chapter 32, we're going to see, in the meantime, what was going on with the Israelites, with Aaron, Moses' brother, being in charge. So it says in Exodus 31, starting in verse 1, when the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, come, make us gods who will go before us. 
As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. Now, I'm kind of using my own inflection here, but what short memories they have. You know that guy Moses? I don't know where he is. So can you just make us some gods to follow? And so, and that tends to be us too. I mean, we could chase that rabbit, but man, we have short memories. We see something amazing that God does in our lives, and the next thing you know, a week later, a month later, two months later, it's like it doesn't impact us anymore, like we've forgotten it, like, like what have you done for me lately, God? And this is kind of where they were. Well, it goes on to say, here's how Aaron responded, verse 2. Aaron answered them, take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing, and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Now, that's a very specific statement. Stick a pin in that, because we're going to come back to that a little later. Then they said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. How crazy to call this God and say, this is your God. This is the Lord. We're going to do a festival in honor of the Lord, this calf that I have formed. So it says in verse 6, So the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterward, they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. Whew. So this is what the Israelites were doing. And, you know, if you're like me, I'm thinking, oh, there it is. When the cat's away, the mice will play. These Israelites, with their leader gone up on the mountain, they just do whatever they want to do. And they just, this is horrible. How dare them? This is, well, here's the thing. Before we cast too much judgment on them, I think what we see happening in this passage is something that's way more of a universal experience than maybe we're willing to admit. That we have this tendency as human beings to idolize. It's something innate within us. Have you noticed it? We have this desire to follow something. We have this desire to worship something, to, to install something that's bigger than us before us and belong to it or follow it or worship it or idolize it or make it central in our lives. This is just a tendency that we have. And maybe you can make the argument that, you know, at its very worst, sports can become like that. Or even good, th you know, not th I love sports, and, and boy, that steps on my toes a little bit. I don't want to be make that a calf that I follow. But, but I'm here to tell you, anything that we treat like God should be treated can become like that. And we all have a tendency to do that because we have this innate desire to idolize. I really believe, and I don't know for sure if it's true, I believe it's something about the way God made us. That he sort of put this homing device in our soul that we crave worship, that we crave to follow something, we crave to belong to something. And the problem is with our inherent sinful nature, we tend to choose or create something other than the one who made us to treat like that. And I'm here to tell you, it's a big deal when we do that. It's a big deal when we do that, and we see that, that the Israelites did that, and, and we'll talk a little bit about the, the, the sort of the, the uh, downfall of that, sort of what fell out as a result of their choice to do this. But the reason that we don't just kind of shrug this off, because we could shrug it off, okay, we all do this. We all have a tendency to idolize. We have a tendency to put things on a pedestal or someone on a pedestal. What's the big deal for all doing it? Well, the reason it's a big deal is because something about God that we don't always think about that's very true about God. And when you come to understand this thing about God, it, it can kind of change things for you a little bit. And here's what it is. God is a jealous God. He's a jealous God. And more than you know and realize, you need him to be a jealous God. And more than we often understand, you want him to be a jealous God. Now, when I first began following Christ as a teenager, 
you know, I was hungry to learn more, and I was reading the Bible and going to church more than I ever had in my life. And when I came upon this idea and concept in the Bible that God is jealous, that was a head scratcher for me. I mean, is that, did anybody else kind of struggle with that? Like, God is jealous? Is that, I don't know, man. That doesn't sound like a good thing. Like, I've never known of jealousy as being a positive attribute. Man, isn't that great? He's so jealous. Isn't that great? I always wanted to have a jealous guy in my life, you know? And I used to think to myself, uh, you know, good for me. I'm not too much of a jealous person, you know? I'm not that jealous of a guy. And then I met Sherry, my wife. I met her in college, and I started thinking things and feeling things I'd never thought of before, and things bothered me that didn't bother me before, and they call that love, guys. Uh, I, I was jealous. I became very jealous, and, and what you have to understand was that when we first met and we started dating, I'm kind of an old-fashioned guy, and even though I was really falling for her, and even though I really wanted to hold her hand, and yes, I even wanted to kiss her, I didn't. Because I wanted to be respectful, take it slow, you know, take my time. But then, so her older brother is on campus too. He was two years ahead of us at the same college. And if you know Sherry's family, they are the most touchy-feely family on the planet, which I love that about them. But I remember, this is how bad my jealousy got. I remember uh, getting together in, in the dorm lobby, and then here's Sherry's brothers in there. We're all hanging out, and he grabs Sherry and is hugging her, and he's even being silly and throwing her into his lap and stuff. And I'm like, hey, that's my girlfriend. I didn't actually say that because I felt really weird that I was jealous of her brother. <laughs> I was like, that's not good. I mean, I know it's Kentucky, but come on, you know. <laughs> so... I kind of kept that in the vault, but I was really bothered by that. Like, that's, that's mine. That's mine. She's my girl, you know. Well, here's what I've come to understand about jealousy. I mean, and, and before I tell you about that, let me, just in case you're thinking, wait, really? Is God jealous? Is that, is that true? Let me read to you something that God inscribed with his finger on those stone tablets. Exodus 20, 4 through 6 says, You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Serious business. He goes on to say later on in Exodus 34, 14, do not worship any other God for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. I think it's so funny that God gives himself the nickname Jealous. I'm so jealous, just call me Jealous. I love that. And yet it's kind of weird. But that's what he says. Deuteronomy 4, 24, for the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Deuteronomy 6, 15, for the Lord your God who is among you is a jealous God and his anger will burn against you and he will destroy you from the face of the land. Okay, we get it. God's got a jealous streak in him. He's very jealous. When you come to understand the concept of jealousy, you then get to realize that this is not something that we have to deal with. This is something we should want. This is something we should be so just pumped up about. Because if today I go to lunch with my bride, which I plan to do, and I sit next to some other lady, and I hold her hand and make goo-goo eyes at her the whole time at lunch, yeah, I already hear y'all, <laughs> then I will not be here next Sunday. No. <laughs> uh, if I do that, and after that's over, we go to the car together, and she is just totally fine with it. She's like, hey, it was a good lunch, wasn't it? And we go home and go on about our day. I should hate that. That should bother me because guess what? What I've just learned is that Sherry Roy Clark, my wife, does not care. Don't care. Do it. I don't care. And see, God gave us jealousy in and of itself isn't a bad thing. We make it out to be bad, but it isn't bad. 
It's a built-in alarm system that God gave us. And it goes off when, and I'm going to make sure I say this correctly, it goes off when something reserved for you is being given to someone else. Something exclusive for you is taken and given to someone else. When that happens, jealousy should come up. Now, the problem is, the reason jealousy gets a bad rap is because there's a lot of us that have totally oversensitive jealousy alarms. That's a problem. And that's a whole other sermon we won't go into. But the truth is, is that jealousy happens when something reserved for you is being given to someone else. And you need to understand what God's word says. God is jealous for you. So that when you give something to something or someone else that's reserved for him, it bothers him. And isn't that awesome? It's awesome because that means he sees you as his. That you're his person. You're his daughter. You're his son. And he's jealous for you. And and he wants to be only the one true God that exists. He wants you to see him as that. The one true God that exists who created you and who sent his son to die for you. And he wants to mold you and shape you so that you can live out the plan and purpose that he has for you until you close your eyes on this side of eternity and open your eyes on the other side in his presence forever. He desires that for you so that when we flirt with other things or other people and treat them in a way that really only God should be treated, he burns with jealousy. And we need this. And we want this. I think this reminds us once again, we've said it before, and I'll say it again. Christianity isn't religion, guys. Christianity is a relationship. I mean, you don't get more relational than this, right? This is very relational that God is like, I made you and I love you and I want to be with you forever and I got a plan for you, so don't go flirting on me. (laughs) Treat me the way you should treat me as the one true God. And we need him to be this because when we separate and divide our allegiance and we begin to take that allegiance and replace the one true God with something or someone else and say, this is needs to be followed in my life. I need to follow that. I need to to pay attention to that. I need to prioritize that. We start down this slope where we're now all mixed up. And I think so many of us are wondering why we're stuck spiritually, why some things don't seem to be kind of right in our lives. There's a lack of clarity. There's a catch in our spirit. There's a, a dryness in us spiritually. There's something not quite adding up. There's something missing. And I believe most of the time, it's because we've had something or someone else around us that we have treated like God, and we're following that instead. And listen, you will never get to where God is leading you when you're following a cow that you've made. And make no mistake about it, we make them. We make them. My favorite verse in this story, I'm going to read it to you in a moment, but let me tell you what happened next. So Moses is up on the mountain getting those tablets, not iPads, stone tablets. <laughs> and, and this is all going on with this golden calf down off the mountain, down in the valley. So what happens next is God tells Moses, you better get down there. You got to see what your people are doing. And I'm so mad at them, I'm going to wipe all of them off the face of the earth, and I'm going to start all over with just you, Moses. This is what he said. And Moses pleaded and begged, said, God, don't, don't do this. Do not do this thing. The whole world will look and see Look at what God did. He, he, he delivered the Israelites out of slavery into Egypt just to kill them all at the foot of the mountain. So he begged God, don't do this. So God, it says, changed his mind and decided not to do that. So then Moses comes down off the mountain with the two stone tablets, and then he sees that golden calf, and he sees them worshiping it, and he sees them indulging in revelry, and he gets so mad, he throws those stones down, and they break He takes the golden calf and he grinds it into gold dust and he puts it in their water and makes them drink it. That sounds like an angry parent, doesn't it? Like, oh, I'll show you, you're going to eat that calf, right? That's what he did. And then he goes and finds his brother Aaron. 
and he confronts him about what happened. And my favorite verse in this story is verse 24. It says this. This is the words of Aaron. So I told them, whoever has any gold jewelry, take it off. Then they gave me the gold, and I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. I couldn't believe it. I threw all them earrings in, and poof, there's a cow right there in front of me. Now, if you go back, I told you to stick a pin in that one verse. When he took those earrings and he put it in the fire, he took that gold out and it says he got a tool and he fashioned it into a calf. It took time. It took planning. It took effort. It took intentionality. He made that cow. And friends, don't let anybody tell you otherwise. The things we follow instead of God, we make them. We create them. And we laugh, and I laugh at what Aaron said. It's ridiculous. It's hilarious. It's what we do, right? Self-preservation. I don't know what a cow just showed up, you know? But we say the same thing. Like, we say things like this, like, I don't know what happened. I don't know how I got here. I don't know what made me do that. We did it. And one of the most transforming things that could ever happen in your life is when you take a step back and say, man, I do do this. This is is what I do. I, I, I follow something else other than God sometimes. I create something else to follow instead of God sometimes. And it gets me in trouble. It gets me in trouble. What I want us to do starting today and over the next five weeks, is to begin a journey where we take an inventory of our very lives and we discover the cows that we have created. And you may be sitting there saying, I don't know, man, I I think I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't think I worship any idols. I don't think I do that. Well, I want you to hold that idea loosely today and the next several weeks because we're going to look at a different cow we create for the next five weeks And it may surprise you what you will hear. That maybe there's tendencies you have that you didn't realize you had. Some of you may be saying, I'm sitting here and I got a whole herd of cattle. I can name them right now. (laughs) Well, guess what? There's hope. There's hope. You're not powerless. In fact, what I want you to know today is if there's one thing you're going to get the power to do from God in your life is this, to identify your cow and dismantle it. With his help, you can do that. With his help, you will do that. And I hope that you begin that journey today. The question is really, and the question will be after this series is over, are you actually willing to do whatever it takes to do that? Are you willing to do whatever it takes to identify the cow you have and dismantle it? So every week, I'm gonna give you what I would call a next step to consider. I like to call it Next Step Monday. What we experience here together today ought to make your Monday different, to put it into action, to live it out in your life, wherever you work, wherever you go to school, wherever it might be you go, that you live this out. I'm going to do this in the form of just three statements. Two of them are questions. First, ask yourself today, ask yourself tomorrow morning, what's my driving force today? What's driving me right now? What's my motivation? Man, especially if you're sitting in traffic and you're mad. (laughs) What's my driving force right now? (laughs) What's driving that emotion? What's driving me to do what I'm doing? What is that? And then secondly, ask yourself, is that Jesus? Or is that my cow? And then the question will be on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, will you choose Jesus instead of that? I'm going to push that aside. I'm going to choose to follow Christ. I'm going to choose to do life his way instead of that way. That's the journey I want you to begin today with God's help. But it's up to you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for reminding us today that you are a jealous God. And God, I don't think about it that way very often. I really don't. And you've reminded me today that you love me, you're possessive of me like that. 
And that when I choose to treat something or someone else the way only you should be treated, that it it causes you to burn with jealousy. Father, may we feel the singe of your jealousy today. May we make a determination today that we're no longer going to follow these golden cows we've created, that we are determined to worship you and you alone, Father. The choice is ours. And all over this room, I pray that you would speak to the hearts that are here. And Lord, that they would decide to worship you alone. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.